You are listening to the Horse Radio Network, part of the Equine Network family. This is episode 122 of Retired Racehorse Radio on the Horse Radio Network, part of Equine Network, brought to you by Kentucky Performance Products, Cashel Company, and Morton Buildings. Retired Racehorse Radio is your guide to the adoption, care, and training of the retired racehorse, brought to you in cooperation with the Retired Racehorse Project and New Vocations Racehorse Adoption Program. On today's show, we kick off our From the Judges Booth mini-series with Grand Prix dressage rider, coach, trainer, and judge, Lauren Annette. During this mini-series, we will ask the question you've always wanted to ask your judge, what are you looking for? From there, we speak with trainer and OTT enthusiast, Richard Lamb, on his thoughts on thoroughbreds and how they evolved over the years. And last but not least, we connect with Leander Cooper from New Vocations, who brings you a training tip and our adoptable horse of the week. Stay tuned. And they're off on Retired Racehorse Radio, the podcast that is your guide to the adoption, care, and training of the retired racehorse. This is Joy Orr in Detroit, Michigan. And this is Kristen Kovach bentley in Jamestown, New York, and you're listening to Retired Racehorse Radio. Kristen, what have you been up to now that, you know, it's not dark after five o'clock? I know, it's such a delight. We're almost to the point where I think Eric can start to come down to the farm after work, so that'll be mm-hmm. a fun time. Um, my winter of doing chores alone is nearly at its end, so. And we had like that, did you have the same warm snap? Like for like we a week and did. a half. It was so beautiful. It was delightful. Yeah. Like I don't mind winter. Like I'm like, I'm a four seasons person, but it, it was such a delight to have, what is it called? First fall spring. And yes. now I'm like, oh shoot. Cause it's snowing again, but it is what it is. It's fine. But yeah, we got a lot done. Like we had a really productive, like 10 or so days getting horses worked lightly, you know, but like yes, all the horses it was cut such out. So. a beautiful time. Um, I almost want to tell mother nature, like no taxi backsies, very upset. By the the little snap that we have. It's not terrible though. Like it's cold, but it's still like sunny out. So I'm like, okay, well, it's not yeah. the most insulting thing that nature could do to me. But yeah, it, it definitely demotivated me to go back to the barn a little bit. Still going, just not as enthusiastically as I did with that yeah, beautiful right. warm weather. But, but at least you're able to ride your horse again. I am. She's like knock on wood, she's healed for now. Um I shouldn't say it that way because honestly, I've been super lucky with her. Like, and this is the first time we've ever had like an injury where I couldn't ride her. Like, I've been the one injured. I'm actually the one who fails the vetting exam every time. But <laughs> you're the one we need a bubble wrap. <laughs> exactly. Like, it's always been me for any issue. But like, this is the first time it was her in the seven years that I've owned her, which I think is pretty good statistics for any horse owner. <laughs> See, I was worried with all the times that you've been like, she's a cockroach. She's going to live forever. I was like, oh, girl, you knock wood because it's coming. But it was minor. So that's good. I know. It still isn't even that bad. And like our yeah. best guess is like she likes to nap. Like the horse likes to get her beauty sleep. You can pretty much find her napping from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. almost every day. Um, and she sleeps hard. Like I've watched my horse twitch in the pasture. And like, I'm surprised no one's called me that they think she's dead. Or like they having haven't. a seizure or something. I know, like she <laughs> yeah. dreams. It's super cute. But we think she like probably got stuck in the mud getting up and just like twisted her like a little bit in the back. So it was a very minor soft tissue injury. Only took a couple of days for the swelling to go down. And she was still able to be like turned out in the indoor. So like not even anything that serious. Um, we just didn't want her in the mud in case she made it worse. But man, was she the perfect stall rest patient? Like she was so well behaved that I actually accused my bar manager of drugging my horse. I was really jelly. Like you were sending updates and stuff. And I was like, well, that's not fair. I didn't expect it at all. Cause like, (laughs) I, I mean, this horse, when I first got her, um, and I'm really excited for when listeners hear our segment with Leandra, um, where we talk about leveling of horses, you're going to really enjoy this next part. When I first got her, she tried to tear my stall apart and I actually had to remove one wall to put in like a window wall so she could see the other horses. Well, I did not think this was going to go well at all. And I was really prepared to call the vet for drugs. And she was fine. She like yelled for her friends for about 20 minutes and then accepted no one was coming. And so she just ate her hay and didn't peep the rest of the day. And she wasn't depressed. She didn't have a fever, like nothing like that. 
she would come out like super easy. Like the kids were taking her out to let her run around in the arena. And by run around, I mean, she trot up and down once or (laughs) twice. And then the real menacing thing, which was in our group chat was, I was like, well, I want her to be out for a long period of time. So I started working in the arena because she'd scream if she could see me in the observation room. (laughs) So if I, if I sat in there with her, she was fine, except she wanted to to work with me. And she crashed my Zoom meetings. She tried to throw my computer. She did throw my cell phone. She tried to groom me. She tried to knock me out of the chair. The horses um, are the worst coworkers. <laughs> she, my team members who are not horse people really enjoyed having a horse like sit in on their conversations. So, so that was super cute. Um, but yeah, she was definitely a menace to the work environment because she's like, we're just going to pay attention to me if you're going to be here. The Astrid show. That's hilarious. Yes. But so yeah, actually what perfect. was kind of funny was that like, yeah, and that that little group chat that we have with uh, a couple other like standard bread, thoroughbred folks, mm-hmm. like we were taking turns passing what we were calling winter fat leg around. Yes. <laughs> because Jabber did something stupid. I will never know what he did because I only get to go out to the farm once a day and like they're not observed for most of the time. Yeah. So I don't know if he like kicked himself in the leg or like punched his foot like I, who knows like yeah i don't know though he's a walking you know death machine but uh yeah he ended up with like a thick front leg and i was like what the heck you know so a little butte a little cold hosing and wrapping and poultice and blah 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 and it, it eventually went down but like then we passed it off to someone else and then yeah. someone else in the group chat had it and i was like oh no so yeah i think everyone's had a turn with winter fat leg and we've all moved on so that's we've great all moved on. we're all doing better i had you know, my first ride and I thought she was going to be a lunatic and she was actually just perfect, perfectly chill. She's still like a little bit sore where she strained her butt cheek. I think it's just tight mostly. There's no heat anymore, but um, it's going to bring her back slowly. And she seems really happy to be back at work. I think she just likes the attention and the amount of treats that she gets because I spoil her. So that's like good. that. I would like yeah. that for getting back into work, like after Christmas, more treats. I know. It's like, if I work harder, do I get more treats? It's certainly Mm -hmm. not more money, but that's... (laughs) (laughs) Oh, goodness. But I am excited for spring to come. I'm like thinking about show season and I'm actually kind of excited for it. I think last year when we were talking about like goals and things, I just wanted to like do one or two shows, but I wasn't super optimistic. And I'm like, my horse proved me wrong that she actually enjoys going out and doing things and trying new things. And Mm -hmm. so now I'm actually excited to give her that experience. And hopefully we get to do a clinic offsite this in the next few weeks, actually. Um, So that would be exciting. Nice. Yeah. You're moving right into it. Yeah. Yeah. We're still like at least a couple months away from still kind of (laughs) in hibernation. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, I'm kind of, I'm hoping that we get, uh, we got to get out and start practicing our roping because we're going to have calves on the ground starting probably mid April. So once that happens, then we actually need to be like semi proficient ropers to help, you know, catch these newborn calves. They're newborns. They get really fast, really quickly. Like I need to ask Zach if he's practiced, I can send him to help you. There you go. He'd be so excited. If nothing else, Zach's lanky enough that he could just sort of like pancake onto these things as they're running. I mean, he does do martial arts. He could probably perfect. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. If he's not ready to rope, he can definitely be a ground man because we need we need good ground men. (laughs) <laughs> but uh, yeah, you have to catch them, you know, and they they need a couple vaccines like as early as you can get to them. And then they need an ear tag. Um, every calf gets a farm ID tag and then a New York state ID tag on the other ear. And then, you know, if it's a male, then this it's got to very get like physically so. taxing, Kristen. It's not bad sounds- for me and Eric. It's not fun <laughs> for our ground man who does all the work. <laughs> I know. I was like, man, this sounds like yeah, I would really get my, my steps in. <laughs> it's a good like CrossFit. You're doing lots of different things. And then the whole time, like we found a good system that works as if Eric ropes it and holds it. And then Jobber is quicker on his feet. So Jobber gets to haze the mother so that the mother is not running over the ground man. So again, I'm really selling this ground man position. Yeah, Everybody send like, their significant others. How is this not a TV way? show? I would watch it. We should but- get a GoPro for Charles and he can wear it. Just to oh. see what he deals with, because sometimes the cows get around Jobber, and I'm like, if you guys oh, want oh. that content, <laughs> so, message yeah. us. Yeah, GoPro we're to accepting sponsorship. Thank you. <laughs> Please, that'd be awesome. That would be awesome. 
But um, no, I'm excited for it. I always love seeing your Instagram and the different babies and like which cow is holding her baby hostage. That was really mm. fun for me last always. year. All of them, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but it's definitely, it is fun to see the the baby season. And I don't know if you guys follow any of the, like the different racing farms and stuff, but it's foaling season two started. So that's just all the baby animals. Like we're getting to springtime. It's an exciting time. Um, and it's my favorite time of year personally, because that means warmer weather and lighter days and more riding. But speaking of all the excitement, we have a great episode coming for you today. We have our judges mini series kicking off, which I think you're really going to enjoy because I have a lot of questions of what I hope the judge wants to see in my horse. I have some assumptions, but also, am I right? I don't know. We're going to find out. And then we're also going to hear from Richard Lamb, who is one of the funniest people I've ever had conversations with, but also incredibly bright and has great thoroughbred experience. Before we dive into all that, we're going to hear from our premier sponsor, Kentucky Performance Products. Frequently Asked Questions brought to you by Kentucky Performance Products. I know my older horse will benefit from a joint supplement, but can it help my younger horse too? Yes, it can. The joints of young horses experience daily wear and tear that can lead to joint degeneration over time. A well-balanced joint supplement provides the building blocks necessary to support healthy cartilage and synovial fluid so horses stay sounder longer. Joint Armor is the product of choice for younger horses. It provides high levels of both glucosamine and chondroitin plus 100 milligrams of hyaluronic acid. Joint Armor is herb-free, so there is no worry about it testing in show horses. Betsy sent us the following comments after she started her five-year-old quarter horse mare on Joint Armor. My vet recommended I try Joint Armor. After 10 days, I couldn't believe the difference. She is now floating across the arena and willingly forward with impulsion and suspension. I am thrilled. She is happier too. Ears up and a soft eye. Thank you for such a great product. You can learn more about Joint Armor at kppusa.com. Got questions about your feeding program? We can help. Email Karen at questions at kppusa.com or call us at 859-873-2974. Joy, really excited to kick off like a little mini series that we've wanted to do for a long time uh, from the judges booth where we've, we're connecting with some judges and getting them on the show to talk about what judges are looking for. And of course, exploring that kind of like spicy topic of whether or not there is in fact a thoroughbred bias in judging, because that's something that a lot of people think exists. Um, so today we're joined by Lauren Annette, who I have first connected with through the makeover. She's been a dressage judge for us for a long time and lots and lots of fun to have at the makeover over. Uh, She's a small R dressage and Western dressage judge currently pursuing her large R dressage license. So she knows what she's talking about. Lauren, we're really excited to have you here. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, cool. Well, like it's fun to hang out with you at the makeover, but especially fun to actually get to sit down and talk with you for a while. So, um, and Joy, of course, is a dressage writer by, I was about to say, uh, by choice, which makes it so much like Not by force, it's by choice. <laughs> uh, so I know Joy has plenty of questions for you as well, but, you know, let's just start off with, you know, like when you're in the judge's booth on a typical, like, you know, dressage show, what kind of horses are you seeing at the levels that you're usually judging? So as a smaller dressage judge that recognized competition, I'm licensed to judge second level and below for dressage and for Western dressage level one and below. Um, so we're going to see everything at the lower levels. It, it's not any sort of specific breed within that, unless I'm hired for a breed show in particular, whether it's the makeover or an Arab show or a Morgan show or a gypsy banner show. But I primarily just work within the discipline and I see all kinds of riders and horses. How much fun are the Gypsy Banner shows? That sounds awesome. I know. Like, I'm like, lots of hair. Not to pivot, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's definitely a lot of hair. Um, and they're just very nice. And the guy that organizes the shows, I've worked for him for quite a while, similar to working for you guys at RRP. So, I'm, you know, as you get to know the people that run the shows and management, it becomes more fun, I think, to work those shows. But yeah, the Banner shows are interesting because 
I mean, basically they're a version of a draft horse that's pretty. So seeing that come through is interesting, but everything runs well and uh, it's just good. Nice. So do you have a particular favorite kind of horse that you'd like to watch or judge? Yeah, I like to watch horses that understand their job. So Mm -hmm. you could say I I like to see harmony. So I want to see an understanding of what is expected between the rider and the horse. And that's going to crossbreed or honestly discipline. I think you can see that harmony throughout. And it's one thing that I've always really appreciated about the makeover. When you bring all the judges together at the end, you can really see the most harmonious pair when you bring those 10 disciplines together and we all get to see it amongst one another. Uh, But yeah, a horse that knows its job with a rider that knows how they're trying to communicate is it's kind of, it gives you goosebumps, honestly. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. I'm really glad at the makeover that we've, you know, modified the way that we choose the thoroughbred makeover champion to make it, you know, that the 10 discipline judge panel, because for one thing, like from a personal note, I get to sit next to the judges booth where you all are. And you're very entertaining to listen to all of you all day long. Uh, But also I just think it's just like a, it's a neat way that you get to see other disciplines working, you know, and, and truly like a good horse with a good foundation of training rises to the top every time, no matter, you know, if it's a dressage horse or a ranch horse or whatever it is. So it's, just, it's just really cool to see, you know, that like everybody can recognize that even if they're accustomed to working in their own discipline. Um, so that's this one of my highlights of the makeover is getting to listen to all your commentary from the judge's box. <laughs> no, and I think every judge you would talk to would a hundred percent agree. Like it's so interesting for us to also be able to discuss amongst each other and collaborate because there's, you know, things we don't know about, like, yeah, we're horse people, but the specificity to get to the point of the makeover is more detailed than general knowledge. And so we're getting to hear like from more knowledgeable people within those disciplines. And and then, but we know like a happy horse, all of us know a happy horse Mm -hmm. being able to appreciate that is so exciting to see how it plays out and obviously this last year when the dressage horse won the whole makeover like we were definitely super proud but at the same time we're always proud of all the horses that make it that far yeah yeah and that's a really really nice horse that um knock him down yeah. from allison o'dwyer that was a lovely lovely horse that you know really moved pretty far in his training too so very cool so Okay. Now I am not a dressage. Well, I'm not a competing dressage rider. I would argue that like the foundation of most training is dressage. every discipline, whether you guys want to acknowledge it or not. Right. Yeah. So I still consider myself like a dressage (laughs) rider in the sense that I am training my own horses. Um, you know, and, and even as a ranch rider, I think there's so much, like, I still want all the same things that a dressage person is looking for. Anyway, that could derail us for a long time. Um, (laughs) But from what I understand, you know, and and I just spent a lot of times just sort of spectating these conversations, but there's always conversations, you know, especially at, I think, upper levels about like these big flamboyant warm blood movers versus someone who comes and rides a very accurate test, but they don't have as flamboyant of a mover. So, you know, where I'm going with this, right, is like a lot of people are like, well, my thoroughbred doesn't have the movement or the expression of a warm blood, so he's not going to be as competitive. So Mm -hmm. what's your take? Like, I can kind of tell from the way you answered the earlier questions, like where I think you're going to come down on this. But, you know, what's your take on that debate? Like, what are you looking for? That's the big question, right? Like, what are you looking for when you are judging a dressage test? Right. So for me, like I'm looking for correctness and like, it comes down to three basic gates. How correct is the rhythm in all three gates? And then yes, there's room for more expressive movement within it. But honestly, like even on your thoroughbred, you can develop it. And I'm definitely a grassroots judge and writer that's come through the judging program on an Anglo Arabian and the, uh, the mare I bred had steeplechase bloodlines. She didn't race, but it was a thoroughbred. So like my investment in the thoroughbred and understanding how to optimize those gates is what drew me to dressage apart from just being a backyard farm kid, because I saw that I had an opportunity to learn how to do better. So for me, that is where I was sold on this discipline because I could look at six core values And if I had a horse that wanted to spend some time with me and I like was able to communicate with them in a way that they were okay with it, like we could move through the levels. I'm not going to say easily, but reasonably. 
Um, so for me, it's more about how correct it is versus how expressive or exciting it is to watch. And I think ringside, there can be a lot of talk like with people that I think they mean well, but sometimes what they say is like not not quite fair to the horse or mm -hmm. this the timing of where the horse is within that training. So I'm going to go for maybe to answer your question more specifically, less flamboyant, more correct. Mm -hmm. And with that. a lot of the, like the off the track thoroughbreds, like are they tracking up in the trot? That's their bigger problem. Oftentimes their walks and their canters are okay. If they'll walk, some of them won't walk for a little bit. And maybe not by the time we see them at the makeover, but their canners are usually like pretty beautiful and it's <laughs> right. sort of their gift, but is the trot tracking up? And do you have a rider that understands how to communicate? I need you to take a bigger step and I need you to lift over the top line. And uh, I think if you have someone with enough patience and understanding, like that comes through, it doesn't come through fast, but at the same time, like for me, what I would consider fast is about like 18 to 24 months to convey that message to the horse. I think that's fast, but no, it's not going to happen in one lesson or because you work on it for four weeks or something. So it's how do we like get the message out that we need to be looking at the bigger picture, like paying attention to the small bits that happen like day to day, week to week, month to month. But we shouldn't really be expecting these, especially our off the track thoroughbreds to be more expressive in the trot in less than six months. And if we only have however many months we have before the makeover, but for me, this is like the makeover. What I love about it is it's a competition and process. Like it's right. something that sets these horses up. It's not, it's not what's going to make these horses at the end of the day. Right. And yeah. It's I, never the end mm -hmm. goal. Yeah. That's it's always just yeah. a milestone. Like right. it's just one milestone of many for them. Yes, exactly. And for the riders too, I think like to be able to, you know, be patient enough, but brave enough to take a chance. And it's just so inspiring when you see people embody that mindset and try to empower these horses. And I, I think any judge there can really relate to it and you feel it from the riders and, you know, honestly, a lot of the horses, it's, it's impressive. Lauren, I feel like you've made so many good points that I, I hope people like actually like rewind and rethink about, because I think two rider types come to mind from what you just described. And one is when you talked about the horse that needs to be able to trot up, because I would agree the trot is the hardest one, but I think there are riders who are afraid to let their retired race horse go and find that big movement, especially at their first couple shows. Like, are they going to bolt? Are they going to react? Are they just going to go into the canter? Like they're trying to box them in for this perfection. And I was right. guilty. I was one of those riders where I was like afraid of my horse finding her movement because historically in those first couple months of training, it was because like, let's gallop, let's go. And I wouldn't let her kind of find her balance and sense of self. So I, I, I'll admit I was one of those riders and um, how to, how to overcome and just kind of have some trust in the horse to find that, that trot up. Like, do you have any tips for that person? To allow yourself to be a part of the process and to consider like when we want, so I'm going to say perfection, but for dressage, our aim is excellence. A 10 is excellent, not perfection. And I think what's really unfortunate is a lot of people drawn to dressage want perfection, but it's not a relevant expectation. And, and to give grace to the process and allow it to happen more organically. And if, if the horse gets a little bit expressive, but you can channel it, let it be and mm -hmm. know that, you know, as riders, we kind of joke. Because also, like, as dressage riders, we're not, like, the most fun people you're ever going to meet, right? But so one of our jokes is that, like, competing is kind of like going to Vegas. What happens in the box stays in the box. So yeah. if they're going to be overly expressive, keep it in the box and then get going on the next box. So um, I think... Yeah, it's a process. I mean, we all think about, like, our foundations, right? Like, just think about where you're actually at. That's what I always have to remind myself because I'm a perfectionist and I want to cry all the time. <laughs> but I like to use oh, no. that foundational box, just like pause and be like, where am I actually at? Like, where was I? 
like a couple months ago or even a year ago. I, I think that is a really relevant point. And I think we need to know where we are, where we want to go and where we've come from. And I'm not saying live in the past, but I, I think it's, we're selling the horse short if we don't acknowledge the steps forward we've taken. And um, I, I think it sounds to me like you have a really good approach to that, but I see a lot of people that seem defeated at times. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, but a horse that came off the track and it has a totally different life right now. And like, nothing's really going wrong. Like maybe it could go better, but like no one's hurt. The horse isn't hurt. Like it, it's okay. Mm -hmm. And just trying to embody that sense of even if today isn't your day, like how do we channel this forward in a positive perspective? So I think the short answer is a lot of it is a mindset of saying like, how do we keep the scope or the big picture realistic enough that you don't beat yourself up about it unnecessarily. And also don't keep people around you that might want a quick fix. Cause it's not real with horses. Like they need a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. They need a little bit of space. And I, I know sometimes it can feel damning from judges, right? Because a lot of what we put on the test is constructive feedback, mostly in an effort to make sure we're not talking too much but I think it can feel negative sometimes to riders and that's absolutely not the intention of the judge or the sport, but I do understand where it feels negative and we're all like being coached on how to be better at that mm -hmm. as judges. But so just to try to make sure when you read that test, you try to put it in a light that you see a path forward, not that someone is saying you've done a bad job because no one is saying that. And that is what I'm going to be printing out to put my tack locker this year. I'm going to take that quote from you. <laughs> That's okay. Um, just as a good reminder. And, you know, I want to go to the other side of the spectrum too, where you have the writers who do want the quick fix. And I don't want to say they're the ones who are quickly going to a warm blood or anything like that. I think there are those writers, like I'll never write a thoroughbred. Like that's not what they're interested in. And that's fine. That's why there's so many horses out there. There's someone for everybody. But um, what about for the writer who feels pressure, like they have to be at that spot that they want to be? They have to be, quote unquote, competitive, right? Like that bias of my thoroughbred's not good enough. What advice would you have for them? So I think I would encourage increased education. Like, are you able to audit an L program or go to the trainers conference in Florida or just spend more time around some people that compete at more of the upper level events. Because I think also the social media reel where everything looks fabulous isn't mm -hmm. real life. So it's just not a very realistic perspective of even if you have a really nice warm blood, like, first of all, can you stay on it? And literally, mm -hmm. I mean, not get bucked off and get hurt because that happens with some of these horses that are super athletic and it can happen with your off the track thoroughbreds, but generally they're broke. They know how to go forward. Some of them are squirrely, but like, I don't see as many of my clients coming off the off the track thoroughbreds as I do the young warm bloods. Hmm. Um, Interesting. So, and I, I know they're strong and they can bear down or they can be behind the leg and get squirrely, but it's, it's a little bit different than the athletic warm blood. Um, but I think my bigger point is, do you have the opportunity to have a realistic perspective of what is happening? And then can that rider be really honest with themselves about what they want and step away from comparing themselves to one another? Because everyone's journey is so specific and Again, what I really love about dressage is that it's between me and whatever horse I'm on at that time as a rider. And I know it can be hard to not compare myself. And it's easy for me at this stage or easier for me because I've I've gone to higher levels. I've mm -hmm. shown at CDIs, like I've done all these different things. So a lot of what was out there and felt unattainable to me, I chipped away at. And I got there, but I didn't get there on the fanciest horses ever. I got there on horses that I like spending time with and that were easy enough to live with that I could keep them sound and take care of them if they were unsound. Mm -hmm. um, so th I think and that's a tricky one and it's going to depend on the person, but a lot of it is like, just take a step back, think about what, 
what is really important. Figure out how to do it within reason because we all need balance within our lives. And then be fair to the horse and fair to yourself and just go for it. And even if there's like a slight detour, try to embrace it. Like don't don't get too negative about it because there's going to be a lot of detours with horses. It's the unfortunate nature of the lifestyle we have living with them. And you have to be more tolerant than maybe we knew we could be taking care of these horses. Can you come um, on every time and just give us I a pep know. talk? Yeah. Like, can we just call you? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. When you said dressage people aren't fun, that's a lie. But you're also very inspiring. So yes. <laughs> we, need to we, can, we can. We're not like the life of the party ever, though. We're the people in the background that go to sleep early, right? After a couple champagne glasses, we can be really fun. Jeez. Okay. <laughs> so Lauren, I have a question and it, I don't know, it may be a little bit difficult to answer, but there is always people that, you know, want to say like, well, the judge was biased against me because I'm riding a thoroughbred. What yeah. is likely happening? You know, when people say things like that, you know, when someone comes in and is like a little bit on the defensive already because they're not riding a warm blood or riding, you know, an Iberian horse, you know, like whatever we're considering the more typical dressage horse these days, like, right. You come in biased, you know, or you, so, you assume there's a bias, right? Right. Well, and so unfortunately, sometimes I think it can be our insecurity that comes out when we say that, but the way judges are trained and the judges training process is very standardized and we have rider scores. So they don't, they don't care. Like for me that I was on an Anglo-Arabian, I still had to say, have the same rider scores as other people. And the time I started going through it, the rider scores increased. So I had a more normal gated horse that I had to score higher on. So it was technically harder for me, but at the same time, I had to get better at training to be able to earn the higher score. So a lot of what happens on the baseline level, it's basics plus criteria plus or minus the modifier are where the numbers are generated. And we know each number has a like word correlated with it. But if you want to score like between a, a six and a seven, you need to be like between someone knowing what you're doing and fairly good. A seven's only fairly good. An eight is good. And if we have a horse, honestly, a lot of the thoroughbreds are generally in the seven range for gates. But if their thought is markedly not tracking up, it's it can be difficult to go above six five. But on the plus side, the easiest gate to fix is the trot. So I think a lot of what's happening is we have a lot of horses that can't track up in the trot. So it's hard to go above a seven in the gate score. And my point is all those trot boxes even if you do what you're supposed to do and you can tell what it is, if the quality of the trot is not above a six, the highest you can earn is a 6.5. So we need to be teaching people how to improve the quality of the trot so they get into the seven range so that then it becomes the highest score they can earn is a 7.5. And maybe our off-the-track thoroughbreds aren't going to be getting an eight in the trot right off the bat, but they can get an eight in the canter. They can get an eight in the walk. Hmm. So that's where they're going to outdo a lot of warm bloods in that respect. But unfortunately, at the lower level, the bulk of your scores are earned in the trot work, right? It's not really till pre-St. George that you see like more of the test is focused on the canner. And that is where the thoroughbred can really thrive. But we have to get the riders to the point where they, they don't feel intimidated about bringing these thoroughbreds along to pre-St. George. And I won. Like, it, it should be normal. Like we just have to teach them the skill set. We have we need the riders to know it's normal to know you can train these horses to pre Saint George I one, and it's not such a big deal. It takes time, and and yeah, we have to take care of them, but it shouldn't be something that's such a big deal. And I, I struggle with that a lot. Like, how do I help people know it's not as hard as it's like made out to be? The dressage scoring system, as someone who doesn't know a lot about it, like it just it sounds so logical. And now I'm like, why don't we do this in the ranch? Like, <laughs> I know I'm like, you know, someone who does work, do this and like getting a yeah. breakdown from a judge. I was like, I have been over. It makes so this much this whole sense. Time. <laughs> yeah, it's like a choose your own adventure, right? Like if you can't quite figure out like it's not that there's a bias, it's that you're just not like producing 
quite to the point it needs to be at to maximize the score. Like it just, it makes so much sense logically. Like mm-hmm. the numbers right. part of it, I'm like, oh yes. Like the number part of my brain is like very excited for this. <laughs> so right. That makes right. sense. Well, and I think unfortunately, sometimes in the walk, like these thoroughbreds, honestly, like they have great walks with tremendous overstride, but they'll jig a lot when you touch the bit. So you go from the free walk and try to take them back and they jig. And because that's a loss of rhythm, a loss of rhythm pretty much puts you below a six. Yeah. And then it's depending on how much. Is it a loss of rhythm because the horse does not have even timing of each footfall or because it jigged within anticipation? So if they're jigging in anticipation, we can stay in the five range. But if we don't have even timing of each footfall, we have to be in the four range or below because that's not a pure gate. And we need to make sure we're sticking to clean gates. And that's where, you know, these thoroughbreds have clean gates and they work hard. And they can canter all day long. So, like, you know, you can get there. They just need some time. I love those points. Like, one of my favorite things to do during show season is actually just scribe. I feel like I learn a lot sitting next to a judge and hearing their different comments. Like, you always hope you're sitting next to a judge, much like yourself, Lauren, who's willing to, like, share insights and what they're actually hoping to see. And one of the best things I ever heard, and I'll never forget it, is um, one of our judges was saying, seeing all these thoroughbreds come through and she's like, I want to score that horse higher, but these riders don't know how to ride thoroughbreds. And would you say that's actually a very accurate thing to say? I want to be cautious because I want to offend any of our listeners, but like we might take what we've learned in traditional riding. You think back to the school horses, you were probably riding stock horses and Arabs and, you know, just kind of your, your basic backyard pony. Um, Would you say like some of us maybe haven't learned how to help bring that thoroughbred along to really bring those gates out. So I think there's room for the dressage industry to teach people how to optimize the gate. And I also think, I don't think we get the word out enough about what the sport is looking for. Mm. And, and that's where I think it can feel like there's a bias. Cause I don't think people understand like how the judges are trained or what we go through to keep our license. Like they're, it's not a very forgiving process. And when we go for our promotions, again, it's not very forgiving. Like they support us, but it's not the most positive thing we're ever going to do, but they want to make sure we can accept the pressure and acknowledge the pressure that is real because we can't be putting things out there that is unfair. And, and on the sports under a lot of scrutiny right now too, right. For people Mm -hmm. doing bad things to horses and, Mm -hmm. and it should be, but most of us are really trying to uphold harmony and respect for the horse. And it's unfortunate that there's this, this group of people with higher level expectations treating the horses unfairly and that that is gaining more press than I think people, I just, so for me, along the lines of what you're asking, I don't think we're getting the information out to people to know how to do better. And I don't exactly know how to change that, but I'm hoping that more conversations like this, or like, if you have ideas, like, how do we let people know how to optimize the gate? Like, how do we let them know there's something beyond what that horse offers us that they can have more than one trot? And no, maybe it's not what the medium trot would become in two years, but they need to know they can have more than just the trot that doesn't track up versus the quick trot on the forehand where they sort of run over into the the canter and allowing people to know there's, there's more out there. Did that answer the question? Yeah, I think that's a brilliant point. I didn't even consider just the fact like there's so much knowledge because it's true. Like even when we promoted this mini series before you hopped on, we're like, the question is, what are they actually looking for? Like we can guess, right? We have, and we see what's online. We see like what the highest scoring horses, quote unquote, highest scoring horses are doing. And we make these comparisons on our own, but there is an opportunity. It sounds like just to give judges the floor and say, here's what you're trained on. Here's specifically verbatim what we're looking for. And I don't know, Kristen, it sounds like you have a pitch opportunity to RRP to do like a whole webinar series. I know. Yeah. I'm like, we could have, we probably shouldn't have our current judges on. Well, I don't know. Yeah. Either way, like this kind of conversation, I agree. I think this is, I'd like to think like, oh, we're cutting edge here. You know, we're, 
<laughs> we're putting what the judges want to see in front of an audience in a way, you know, as someone who understands thoroughbreds and the particular challenges with bringing them along too. Mm-hmm. I think that's critical. Yeah. You know, not just to have a judge who's like, well, do this and do that and do this and do that yeah. because, you know, that just doesn't always work. You know, like you understand the the challenges of these horses, you know, like you said, like, right, you take up on the bit and they're like, oh, cool, we're going to go jog around now. And it's like, no, 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 <laughs> you know, but, right. you know, stuff like that, like it makes so much sense. Well, and I think so. even like eventually opening that up to like, how can you help a standard bread or like, because it, it sounds like at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what the breed is. Like, here is what you need to be looking for. and like finding the right people who aren't looking for those quick fixes to get you there, but instead like working with you to like, here's your horse's natural ability. Like how can we emphasize it to get to that place? Like not every horse is destined to be a Grand Prix horse, but you know, where, where can they actually go? Like what's their potential and how do you get them there? Exactly. And maybe not every horse is going to be competitive in the Grand Prix, but those elements, those movements, the horses can learn we just need to teach people that they know how to do it and they know how to do it without violence. And that's the big problem that the sport is seeing because there are some people that took it over with violence and that's wrong. And, and the horses don't need that. Like we can do it without violence. It might take longer, but at the same time, the horses are going to be safer because they're going to understand what we're doing. And, and also just like none of us want to treat horses that way. Right. And it's just, it's very, very concerning what's happening. Yeah, for sure. So Lauren, we'll wrap with one more question. Um, What's the biggest piece of advice you have for, you know, riders who want to do better by the horses who want to be successful in the sport of dressage with thoroughbreds? Um, You know, like, what are you seeing? That's a particular challenge. How can riders, you know, just work to, bring everything together and make things just as good as they can for their horses. So if for the riders that are competing, understand the essence of each box or the, like, what's the priority within the box? Cause each box, you know, it starts at the letter that's mentioned and it doesn't finish until the first letter listed in the next box. So there's a lot of opportunity for things to go wrong. But I think if you know what the most important thing to show is, and then the other modifiers, like, give yourself a break. Like, okay, maybe they're going to wiggle. Maybe they're going to be a little crooked, but no, like take the 0.5 modification and like, keep cruising, keep your horse happy, keep yourself happy and focus on the next thing that is the essence of that box. And, um, try not to get lost in the minutiae. Try not to get lost in the weeds, like keep it in perspective and keep going. I think for me, a lot of it has been someone told me it would take me 10 years to get to Grand Prix and 10 years to get good at Grand Prix. And I could tell you it's taken me a lot longer than that. And um, so even if you can't fit within that like 20 year period of getting good at Grand Prix, don't give up on yourself. Cause even people like me that are a little bit slow with like being good at it, like I'm still doing okay. I'm getting horses to Grand Prix. Like maybe it could be better, but I don't know. Maybe it's where they need to be because at the end of the day, everything's okay, right? Um, yeah, I, that's always the hardest debate, right? Like, mm-hmm. could this horse do better with someone else? I don't know. <laughs> you know, right. maybe, like, maybe it would break. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, yeah maybe horrible. This whole conversation has been so cool. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah, like I think we've gleaned like so much more than we were anticipating, you know, on what judges are looking for. And then just also just like really good conversation, you know, about training horses and doing right by the horse, which is everything that we're after on this yeah. show, you know, and our, our listeners love, you know, tips and training tips in particular. So like, yes, Lauren, you've checked all the boxes. We have to have you back for sure. Yes. Okay. That's great. Well, and I just, I'm so in all of RRP and everything you all do. It is my favorite show. And it's just, I can't even explain how motivating it is to see a group of people on the ground creating this experience for these wonderful horses. And then everyone that you bring together, it, it's, it's unmatched. Like I don't see it elsewhere. And I, I judge a fair amount, so I'm very impressed with everything you all are doing. Well, thank you very much. We love, you know, it's nice to hear that because sometimes <laughs> there's many times when you work in a nonprofit that you you don't hear all the the good things that people enjoy mm-hmm. about it. So I appreciate hearing that. Thanks, Lauren. 
Lauren, if uh, listeners are interested in learning more about your program, um, maybe getting involved, getting some lessons, getting you in for a clinic, where can they learn more? So I have a Facebook page, Ballyvay Farm, B-A-L-L-Y-V-A-E farm.com or, or whatever it is on Facebook. But um, yeah, if anyone is interested there or I I just want to encourage people to like stay positive and keep going as much as I can, because I think there's a lot of also really good local resources that can be underutilized too. Uh, and again, I don't know how to get that message out better about how we describe like what dressage is better. Mm. Well, I'd like to think that hopefully we got, we got the conversation started, you know, mm-hmm. in our way tonight and yeah, we'll keep it going. So Lauren, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your insight from the judges booth. And we are looking forward to continuing this series with listeners, with judges from multiple disciplines. So Lauren, thanks again. Thank you. Well, I'm here with Tony from Cashel. You all know it from the ads you hear all the time on this show, but I we're at the trade show and this is the point of time in the year where we find out what's new coming out. So what's Cash will have new coming out? Oh, we've got a, a great lineup of uh, 32, 34 wool top pads. So uh, t- describe them. Uh, five different colors, real vibrant, bright, sharp looking pads. What, are the, what makes them different? Uh, well, it's the fill. The, the, the wool felt on the inside is a natural felt. And the fleece on the bottom is a hundred percent merino. Oh, really? Okay. So th- these are soft and squishy pads. Well, not real squishy, but soft, and and they do absorb shock and and saddle fit. What would they retail for? What are those? That's you about a hundred and nineteen. That's the right price. Yeah. Anything else new with Cashel coming out? Oh, we've got uh, more saddle pads coming in the fall. A uh, new strap line coming in the fall. It's uh, a two tone that looks great with a, a great buckle set on it. There's, we're always in development, so there's so many things, projects in the works. What's still your most popular product? Is it still always the same things year after year? Uh, fly. You bet. Yeah. Fly, fly that's what we all do. That's, that's how I knew you in the first place was fly. Fly masks. Yep. Yeah. Many years ago, uh, we were primarily fly masks and kind of had some tush cushions and a few odds and ends. Today, we've broadened that offering to saddlebags, uh, strap head stalls, breast collars, bell boots, um, leg protection, and the, the, it continues to grow. Is there a place where somebody can go and see all the products? Uh, Cashelcompany.com will give you a good offering. There you go. Well, thank you, Tony. It's been fun seeing you again. Hey, thank you. Good to see you. Joy, very excited for our next guest, who's like kind of a thoroughbred liberty. Is that a word? We're going to make it a word. Uh, a little bit of a, a celebrity in the OTTB world. Uh, we have with us tonight Richard Lamb, who has worn many hats in the equestrian industry. Uh, right now, you are among many professional uh, endeavors also on the RRP board and has been a past judge at the thoroughbred makeover um, and was generous enough to give me a lesson in slicing bread last year at the makeover house. So <laughs> many, many claims to fame for Richard Lamb, but Richard, welcome to Retired Resource Radio. We are thrilled to have you here. Well, thank you. I'm I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, it's nice to meet you in semi-person, I guess. Auditorily, anyway. Yeah, we're in this fun virtual space where there are no rules, right. and uh, yeah, everything's made up. So, yeah, I still count that as like my greatest claim to fame. You know, like many people have gotten a great riding lesson from Richard <laughs> Lamb in their life, but very few people have gotten a lesson in slicing bread. So, still someday I'll actually get a riding lesson from you, but uh, not not this year. Uh, so, <laughs> ho- hopefully, uh, I look forward to it. <laughs> Yeah, it'd be great. Um, so, Richard, you have like just such a rich history with the thoroughbred and the off-track thoroughbred in particular as a breed. Like, where like you guys go way back? Where did it all begin? Well, I thought you might ask that question, and I don't know exactly the time span. I can't quite say before I was born because that doesn't work. But I had a connection. I have a connection with an off-the-track thoroughbred that is well-known in history for show jumping and actually was on the Olympic show jumping team. My father, I was born in Sheridan, Wyoming, 
and my father had a ranch there. Two of my sisters were born there as well. And he and a partner, I believe, I'm always kicking myself because I didn't get more details from him other than talking with my father. But they owned a horse who was an off-the-track thoroughbred. I don't know his racing record. I could probably find that out at some point. But this was back in the 50s and 40s. He, his name was Trail Guide. And he's well known because he was on the Olympic team. He was ridden by Frank Chapeau in 1964. My father had him and they did some jumping with him, but he did some steeplechase racing. And then I was less than a year old when we left Wyoming and we moved to New England. And then my father bought a farm in, in Woodstock, Vermont, and that's where I grew up. And my father had always had horses, riding horses. He would fox hunted, did some sh hunters, uh, show hunters, all that sort of thing. And back then in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, it was almost all thoroughbreds. I mean, there were some other non-thoroughbreds, but that's what he always ended up. And so that's what I was first introduced to when I was eight and nine and 10 and 11, because that's what my father would end up getting was a lot of thoroughbreds, as well as some crossbreds, thoroughbred crossbreds, because we had a summer riding camp and a riding and a horse farm in, in Woodstock. So I'll just talk a little bit more about Trail Guy. The reason why he's well known, because he was not only on the team, and this is a little bit of a sad story, but at the National Horse Show that was at the Garden in, in Madison Square Garden in New York City for many, many years, and it moved around, used to have international jumping, and there's a memorial trophy given at the National Horse Show. And it's still in existence, but I'm not sure how it's given now, but it was given to the leading international rider for the other teams other than American. And it was given to the highest individual rider. And the reason why it was memorial is because Trail Guide was being ridden at the horse show, in the National Horse Show, and he was going to be retired and unfortunately had an accident. Actually, I think he had a heart attack um, oh, no. and died and, and and collapsed in the ring. And oh, um, yeah, it was very sad. Uh, I know some people that were there and they told me about it after. And it, it was obviously quite shocking. This was back when everybody had black tie, white tie, when it was a very formal thing at the garden. Oh, wow. So in honor of him, because he was on two Olympic teams and competed internationally quite a bit. And he was a thoroughbred as a number of the U.S. team show jumpers were. So anyway, you, you ask about my connection. It really goes pretty far back. <laughs> it goes um, way back, yeah. And I've always sat on thoroughbreds, off the track thoroughbreds, some that never raced. Um, but certainly they're still my favorite horse. And when I started showing and competing, there were a lot of thoroughbreds that were at horse shows. And then it started to transition over to um, crossbreds. And then the warm bloods that were coming over from Europe, European bred. And the warm blood is just a combination of cold blooded horses and hot blooded horses, which would either be thoroughbreds or Arabians normally. Right. And now you don't very often see them in the hunter and jumper world some people still try to do that and it's wonderful when it does happen but you definitely see them in and the thoroughbred blood has always been included in sport horse breeding and that's something that i think a lot of people forget that if we didn't have the thoroughbreds and we don't keep maintaining the thoroughbreds then we won't have the elite sport horses whether it's dressage or even dressage, there's still thoroughbred blood in in a lot of the bloodlines and for eventing and show jumping and just horses in general. Right. So, like, why do you think that shift happened? Like, I would imagine some of it is, like, logistically, it just got cheaper and easier to fly horses around the world. 
but like when 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 did we start to turn more towards the warm blood and why do you think that happened it started in the 60s and 70s the training i would say was more based on flower work and and dressage over in europe it always has been hmm. and they have racing over there especially in you know it's it's very good quality racing but over here our um sport horses and and i'm not casting any aspersions at all but they were not geared towards uh jumping and the higher more elite levels it was you know the morgans you could be you could call our original american sport horse quarter horses um and there are a number of other breeds as well that are more native and people started to bring the european breeding over to bring better jumping technique or uh qualities when in the 60s the us was at the top in show jumping with Bert Tanemethy and in the 70s and they were almost all thoroughbreds for the show jumping and also the eventers a lot of them were straight thoroughbred then the dressage horses were more warm blood had although keen in 1976 was a thoroughbred and oh, you know yeah. won a medal at the olympics so they they were still there and there still are some um, that are more thoroughbred than not. To me, I, I think the combination at this point, why people bring in the difference in the movement, the thoroughbred is not known for its canter as such, but they're known for its gallop. In eventing, you need a horse that gallops. In show jumping, you have to have a horse who's much more adjustable and has a, a, a more um better quality canter and the thoroughbreds a lot of times are are not going to show that but when you combine the trainability uh, i prefer to have a thoroughbred because they always want to work for you they they go forward obviously if they come off the track some of them go forward and faster than others otherwise <laughs> you probably wouldn't get them but they're still used to having that energy and that desire to go forward. And that's what makes training thoroughbreds, I think, so much easier and more productive, more beneficial. And not to cast any aspersions on any warm bloods. I, I, I sit on them. I've ridden them. I've, I've worked them. I taught and sat on and train some and and today um and some show more the uh, aspects of the canter and some show more of the warm blood in terms of movement but also some of the times i think the thoroughbreds want to work with you a little bit more than mm -hmm. some horses that are not all thoroughbred yeah, that makes sense. And, you know, I mean, I come from the Western perspective, but it's it's very similar. And I would say it's even the same thing in quarter horse breeding. Like there's so much thoroughbred in there, mm -hmm. um, but it is really interesting, you know, how we've made that the American breed as opposed to the thoroughbred. So it's almost like, oh, I, I'm just going to go right to the source and just <laughs> skip skip all those generations of of purpose breeding and and just, just go right back to the American thoroughbred. But um, that kind of brings me to, you know, an interesting question of you've seen this breed and worked with this breed now for so many decades have you noticed changes in you know the horses themselves or the quality of horses or you know confirmation or breeding like i, I would imagine that in any breed over the course of decades you're going to see changes so you know what have you noticed in the thoroughbred as a breed well certainly once we take an animal out of its natural habitat whether it's dogs or cats or horses or whatever we start selective breeding for characteristics that that are wanted or needed or that are popular and uh, i'm sure that there has been a difference there are other people that can talk about the specific breeding characteristics that are different now 
But uh, it, there's no doubt that speed and sprinting is has been bred for, especially in this country, because there is a lot of interest in sprinting because that's where the racing is for two and three-year-olds. Mm -hmm. You know, once you get to a three-year-old, that's when you get to the mile and a quarter, the mile and 16th, a mile and a half. You know, that's why there's always discussion about to, whether there should be a change of format or timing for the triple crown. To me, what I see as different, and I'm not avoiding answering the question, but uh, I lived in Ireland for five years. Um, my father had a guest house and a riding center there, and that was in the 70s. And we sat on all sorts of horses. We produced horses. We had fox hunters. I had some event horses, some show jumping. And in general, I would say when you talk about a horse being an Irish type of thoroughbred or an English type of thoroughbred, they're bigger boned. They're not necessarily taller. They might be. But I think that they're also raised differently. They're turned out more there in Europe in general. They don't have a racetrack where people race for you know, all year long or whatever Belmont or whatever the track is in this country, that they, they have months of, of training or of racing and the training is done at the racing. Over in Europe, they train at home or they have the gallops at home and they do the, you know, at Newmarket or in, or the Cura in the in Ireland or just on people's racing centers. And then they go to the week long or the two week long or the, you know, it's not that, you know, a couple weeks long for the festival. In this country, we, we have some of those setups, uh, Fair Hill Training Center in Maryland. So you're asking me about what I've noticed. I would say, I, I guess the biggest change and uh, uh, the, the biggest um, disappointment for me is the fact that there are fewer thoroughbreds being bull, uh, foals every year. And that's what I'm coming back to as far as what the changes that I've seen is that when a stallion becomes popular, everybody wants to breed to him, whether it's, you know, the latest triple crown horse or, you know, some of the time we don't find out these stallions are so good until they're older and they're not used as much. So everybody hopes that, you know, the latest triple crown winner is going to go hot. So his initial stud fee for the first year or two is huge. And then if he doesn't work out, he, he all of a sudden the price drops and someone else gets hot. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, uh, Secretariat is known more as a broodmare sire who then the broodmares, his, his f mares, his fillies, and the female line of his breeding produces some wonderful horses and they're still out there where he never produced a horse up to his level. Right. So I think that's what I'm seeing is that there, there certainly can be horses that are not perhaps as um, showing the soundness. You know, that comes back to, to training. There's a lot of things that we're discovering um, as far as how to go about training in such a way that we produce horses that are fitter, sounder, happier. But also, I, I think the biggest thing is, and I forget what the numbers are, probably someone could look it up right now, but it's, I don't know, it might be half of what there was 20 years ago, the number of foals. Right. But also... But fewer sires, but, maybe. Like, it seems like fewer foals, but concentrated in fewer stallions, too. Co maybe. Correct. And, yeah. and part of that is, you know, I think... If you look back, almost every thoroughbred now is related to Northern Dancer one way or the other, mm -hmm. on one side or the other, because he was such a um, popular sire. 
and again he he was he he wasn't a big horse he was only like 15 hands 14 3 4 15 hands he was not a big from what i can remember but also it comes back to we're losing racetracks there's no doubt but also what was happening is that people were dropping the horses down from tracks with more prize money available down to the lowest level where it was not much at all and that is when the whole thing happened whatever you however you want to put it whereby all of these horses at the end a lot of these horses that would have been basically used up and they would at the end of the race meet when it was closed these horses could be that they would go in all sorts of different directions which was not creating a good result for them and so in some ways the fact that we have fewer tracks could be a you know you could call that a positive because they don't have the cheaper races mm, true. and you don't have the people dropping horses down in in quality just to get paid day money or whatever the case may be well, it's interesting because I think there's an argument that, you know, says that people are doing that. But I wonder if we're just are missing the context that it used to be much worse than it is. Right. Like. Yeah, know, it, it it probably is. But it's also more aware. I mean. Right. Um, you know, people are just more aware. You know, it's the social contract to coin a phrase. Um for horses in general and you know the good and the bad of it is that anything that happens is instantly out there which can have a positive effect or a negative effect and it can take on a life of its own so i think there are more people that are more aware of the right way to do things there's always going to be people that are looking for the cheapest way or the the way to get ahead. And, you know, they've just, you know, they put people in jail for drugging horses and for taking advantage of horses. Right. But that's also to go back to what we're talking, the auspices that we're talking to. This is sponsored by the Retired Racehorse Project. And that's how this all got started was how to increase and develop and increase the marketability of horses that were coming off the track that were coming out of some of these tracks that so that they wouldn't be discarded so that they wouldn't end up um being shipped somewhere for meat or you know they would just be turned out and abandoned yeah so that's what the wonderful thing about the retired racehorse project is that in the past 10 years they have raise the profile of the value and the usefulness and the fact that thoroughbreds are very versatile and can do a lot of different things that's what i say to people you know i don't know what you're doing in the beginning of october but if you're looking for a horse i can guarantee that you're going to go to the to the makeover put on by the retired racehorse project in lexington kentucky and you will find at least one horse you like there. And if you can't, then that that might be your problem. Because there are, <laughs> between the 10 disciplines and the way that the horses, uh, it still blows me away as, as, as judging. I've judged the show jumping, uh, just the straight show jumping a couple of years. And I've done the show jumping for the eventing. And there have been times when I have thought that I could take home probably 50 or 60 or 70 percent of those horses uh, i would take them home not because they're world beaters but just because i just love the way that they moved the way that they dealt with the situation the way that they were so tolerant of the circumstances of the mistakes that might be made or you know the something going on outside of the arena and the horses just have the best attitude in the world. Yeah. Well, and that look that leads into the 
next question I wanted to touch on, which is, you know, are you seeing a shift outside of the work of the RRP? This is not a paid testimonial, everybody. He just like Richard is a fan and that's fine. Uh, but <laughs> have you seen a change in, you know, the equestrian mindset in general to be a little more accepting again of the thoroughbreds kind of like rebounding after we've turned towards the warm blood? Y yes, there certainly is. Um, <clears throat> I mean, you know, with the 10 disciplines, you know, those people have to come from somewhere, whether right. they're yeah, that's competitors <laughs> or the judges, you know, in, in, in the finale, you know, we've, uh, I spent a fair bit of time chatting and talking with, with the discipline judges, and that's at least 20 other people from the 10 disciplines. And, you know, I've enjoyed talking with the ranch people or the the um, polo people. You know, I've been involved a little bit in the polo and I've seen that end of it. Or, you know, the, the fox hunters or, you know, there's so many different ways. And I I think it's there's a much better and stronger and bigger recognition that the thoroughbred, number one, is the basis for all the warm bloods, but also for all of the people that, like I said, if you if you come to the makeover and watch 400 plus horses that were on the track in the past 18 months and only, you know, there's always the horse that was there in, uh, you know, had his last race 60 days ago and they're there and it's just remarkable. Yeah. So I certainly recommend it. I, I my favorite horse is the thoroughbred. And uh actually worked with one today that was at the makeover, a chestnut mare. And I love mares anyway, all things being equal, I'd take a mare. And this mare was wonderful. She didn't have a wonderful time at the makeover, but she, to me, she showed a lot of uh, a good brain, good body, good movement, light on her feet. And she was willing to accept the changes that I was asking the writer to make. And then there was another thoroughbred again today that uh, had been on the track, I don't know, in the past year. She's only six, is going novice and training now. And one of my students, clients, um, 14 years old, rode her to take a look at uh, possibly buying her as her second ride. And today we did cross country. And just every day, I'm always delighted to to see that proven one more time how versatile and how accepting and how talented and and how um, how they handle things like that. It's just wonderful. It is, yeah. It is. It's impressive every time. Like it never gets old to see it over and over again. No. Um, Richard, I think we'd like to wrap and do something that I always want to do with our guests and like we always run out of time. So we're going to make some time and we're going to do a couple <laughs> okay. rounds of rapid fire questions and hopefully joy will throw one or two in there. So, you know, don't think, think with your heart, just give us the answer. What do you prefer sure. bays or grays? Bays. Oh, bays. All right. Go ahead, joy. Oh, mares or geldings, but I feel like you kind of answered this. <laughs> yes. All things being equal mares. Yes. Team mayor. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's see, Del Mar or Saratoga? Uh, I would have to say Saratoga. I haven't had a chance to be at, at Del Mar yet, but I've been mm. to Saratoga. Sar yeah, I mean, they're both good choices, but that's a good get out to yes. Del Mar sometime. That's a cool track, too. Okay. Yeah, that's tree. where the Breeders' Cup is next year, so I might get there. Oh, oh, there you go. There you go. Uh, preferred treat for horses, apple, sugar cubes, or carrots? Uh, carrots. Okay, classic. Nice. And then uh, one more to end on. What's one discipline you've never tried that you really want to try in your life? I think it'd be fun to do reining on a thoroughbred. Oh, yeah. I like that you add, like, it's got to be on a thoroughbred, too, mm -hmm. of course, because you're a lifelong thoroughbred man. I love yeah. that. Well, we'll find your rein and thoroughbred somewhere. Some of those little polo ponies looks like they could just. Well, I've, I've sat on right them over. a little bit, um, just fooling around, but to to actually do the the like a whole pattern, a whole pattern. That before and and cutting would be is a whole lot of fun i've sat on a few cutting horses but um i, I like the variety in the in the reining yeah 
Cool. Well, Richard, thank you so much for joining us. This was really, really cool just to hear about, you know, your insight over the decades and, and you know, your take on the breed. And, you know, I think listeners will find a lot of value in that. Um, where can people find you online? Do you have an internet presence? I do. It's ridinginbalance.com. All one word. It's a website that I have that gives some of my basic ideas and my background and that sort of thing. I haven't updated it recently, but it's there. And I do have some Facebook places there, a few different posting places that in my own name and also writing in balance. And I also do some other things there. And you're based in Aiken. So if anyone I wants live to in listen, Aiken. they can come find yeah, you. I travel and do clinics and things, but yes, I live in Aiken. I've been here, it's hard to believe, about 16 or 17 years now. Very nice. Joy and I should take a trip down in the winter sometime. Yes. When it's really cold. Absolutely. And <laughs> Richard, thank you so much for joining us. It has been a delight. Oh, it, was, it was fun. I, I enjoyed it. And uh, any questions or anything else, just give me a buzz. Catch you later. Now we have part three of our Barn Building 101 series with Wharton Buildings. This time, it's all about building the dream indoor arena. Welcome to Barn Building 101, brought to you by Morton Buildings at mortonbuildings.com. Glenn here, founder of the Horse Radio Network and host of Horses in the Morning. The educational series that we started last year on horse insurance and trailers have proved both popular and educational. We asked you what else you wanted to hear about, and building a barn was high on the list. Joining us for this series is Dennis Lee, equestrian product line manager at Morton Buildings. In this part three of three, we talk about building that indoor arena you've always dreamed about. If you missed part one and two, go to horseradionetwork.com slash barn to take a listen. So, Dennis, you know, site selection and prep is one of the first things to look at. One, you have to have a piece of ground that's big enough to put it on, right? But then it you also have to do some preparation to make it right. Yeah, uh, absolutely, Glenn. And, and really, site selection and site prep is one of the most important factors in building anything, but especially something as large as a riding arena. So, you know, we always want to take into consideration, you know, proximity of the arena to your stall barn, uh, access for, you know, trucks and trailers and truck and trailer parking, uh, but also, yeah, you know, management and mitigation of water. So there's going to be a tremendous amount of water that comes off the roof of a building that size, and you want to make sure and get that away from the building, uh, you know, as quickly as possible. So we, yeah, you know, we like to see a minimum of a one percent slope away from the buildings. Uh, good positive drainage all the way is around that, it. Is that in um, all directions? The one percent? Yeah, that would be in all directions. Okay. So we want to make sure, and you know, and, and every building site is going to have some amount of grading require, you know, some amount of slope. And you're ta- if you're talking a 196 or 200 foot long building, you know, even a very minimal uh, slope on the site, you know, can, can really add up. So you want to make sure and have a good grading plan. And you want that site prepared prior to erecting the building. Some of the uh, nightmare examples that we see out there, people will try and build the building first and then come back and address the grading after the fact. You really only have one opportunity to get that grading and site prep just right. And that's in the very beginning. So in your large indoors like that, when they're like 200 feet long, do you put spouting up or do you have it drained well enough that you don't need spouting on that long span? Well, no, all of our buildings are going to include gutters and downspouts. Okay. But you, know, you have to have a plan of where to take that water. Once right. I was going to ask that because that that's a lot of water coming off of there. It is. It is. So, you know, you need to have appropriate drain tiles and piping to get that water away from the building. But, you know, we also have the, uh, you know, runoff from, you know, the remainder of the site. So if your arena is, you know, adjacent to your barn and you have water coming off of your barn or coming out of the parking lot, you have to have a plan to divert that water around the building uh, as well as the water that comes off the building itself. So size, we all want one bigger than we can afford, right? I mean, everybody does. Um, so what are, is there guidelines? What, what, do we, what do you look at when you're talking to me and I'm saying, okay, you know, I want, I want an indoor, I, I can afford this much, but I really have to do these kinds of things. What do you, where do you start with the customer? You know, arena size requirements are very discipline specific. 
Uh, we do see, you know, some people that are, you know, if you're a cult starter uh, or, a, a, you know, a round pinning person, a 42 foot wide arena may, may work for you. Um, you know, our, your basic dressage arena is going to be 20 by 40 meters. So, you know, you want to make sure to build a building to accommodate that. But one thing that's important to remember, building dimensions are measured from the exterior corners of the building. So you have to make sure and accommodate for the wall thickness of whatever the building framing is, as well as, uh, you know, we highly recommend a tapered interior liner in the building just from a safety standpoint. So when you're talking building dimensions, uh, you want to make sure that you have a large enough building to accommodate the frame of the building, your tapered liner, and then have room for your arena. So a 20 meter dressage arena requires a 66 or a 72 foot wide building. And 81 is even better if you want to have some, you know, some room uh, for people to, to stage and watch around. We offer buildings up to 150 wide for, for your jumping or, or rodeo or rain disciplines as well. That's a large building. How about height? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. Um, you know, height is, is a huge consideration. We don't recommend anything lower than 16 feet for riding arenas. Uh, and if you're, you know, an Olympic show jumper or something where you're doing large fences and large horses, then we really want to even go up from there. And uh, one thing we really want to re- remember nowadays, even more and more buildings are incorporating the large format fans, the large ceiling fans. Yeah. And those fans can hang down about 30 inches. So we want to make sure and accommodate for your show jumper, their great big warm blood horse plus a fan hanging down. Uh, you know, so make sure you have plenty of height there. So a minimum of 16, 19 or 20 is even better. And the other thing we want to remember um, is resale value. So just because you're exercising pleasure horses in that arena doesn't mean that the future owner may not be into show jumping horses. Uh, okay. Now length, I always heard that you should have it twice as long as a wide. That's a pretty good rule of thumb. The best thing to do there is to go out and get some real world measurements from the areas that you're currently riding in. You know, we're, we're all guilty of having relatively low spatial awareness. So the best thing to do is get a big tape measure, go out and take some measurements of the place you're currently riding in, or measure out where you plan to build the arena, put some flags in the ground and ride in that and see if you can, if you can maneuver in that space. I personally ride rainers and rain cow horses, and I've ridden in some 90-wide arenas. And, man, those big, fast circles are just really tough to make in a 90-wide arena. And ventilation, you know, we talked about that with the barn, uh, with the barns. How important is ventilation in arenas? We also all have been in dusty arenas, haven't we? So, Yeah, yeah. so anything equine-related, ventilation is key. You know, horses give off a lot of humidity. Many of us are building at, you know, in humid parts of the country. So we love to see, you know, some big sliding doors on the ends of the arena. Uh, one feature that we've really done a lot of in the last few years that customers have really liked is taking like a nine foot by nine foot garage door and actually installing garage doors as if they're windows along the perimeter of the building. So you can open or close that as you see fit. Um, but yeah, you want to really be able to get a lot of air in there. Uh, in the summer as well as in the winter when it's, uh, you know, it's humid. Dust control, there are arena dust control systems. We've installed several of the uh, misting type of systems that help to control dust. Remember when you're using an arena misting system and you're introducing even more moisture into that building, so you want to make sure that you have it properly ventilated or you'll have a condensation issue. And we've all been in arenas where you're loping a horse around and you take that big fat water drop to the face or your horse gets one to the face and it can be very disruptive. So if you're watering that ground, you want to make sure that you're, you know, that water is going to go somewhere. So you have to accommodate for that to come into the atmosphere. Uh, there's also a lot of synthetic footings available that are dustless. Um, you know, but that's typically something you're going to want to work with the footing consultant on to get that right footing. So the venting, is there venting along the walls where it meets the roof? Is there venting all along there? Yeah, so our buildings are standard with uh, 
uh, one, two, three, or four foot ventilated overhang along the side walls. And then you want to match that with either a powered or a non-powered ventilated cupola. So you want to create directional airflow. You want to pull air in from the overhangs and allow it to be directed directly to the ridge cap uh, through power ventilated cupolas. Well, we have a well-ventilated arena that drains on both sides, but we can't see anything inside of it. So what do you guys do about lighting? So lighting is very important in an arena. I think uh, you know several of us have probably been in some old, uh, you know, dark, really, spooky, scary really arenas Really dark arenas, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, so we love natural lighting. You know, you can do uh, skylights with a vapor barrier on them. They're great for pulling in, uh, you know, natural lighting. There's also what's called a sky belt, which is where you use that translucent skylight panel along the side walls of the building to bring in more light. And then, of course, we're generally going to supplement with a really well laid out uh, supplemental overhead lighting. The uh, LED panel lights are very popular. They pull, you know, relatively little power. The thing about overhead lighting, you want to work with a real uh, quality lighting installer, lighting contractor to get the correct candle powers down at the arena floor. And it is very important to minimize shadows. So we know horses are looking for things to be scared of generally. And you don't want to be loping a horse around and have it spook or shy from some, uh, you know, weird shadow on the floor. So you uh, most now LED lights are pretty much what's put in? Oh, it's about all that we're doing yeah. nowadays, yeah. So there's they make a 2 by 4 and a 2 by 2 LED panel. Um, they're dimmable. You can hang them down from a chain so they're actually at the same plane as your large ceiling fans because you don't want to have shadows from those ceiling fans on the yeah, floors. Okay. The LED lights are incredibly affordable now, and the power savings alone, uh, you know, they'll pay for themselves over in a few years. And any other things to consider when you're building your dream arena? Uh, you know, we briefly mentioned the tapered liner earlier. Um, I am a huge fan of the tapered arena liner from a safety standpoint. You know, it keeps those horses off the structure of the and building just let's, enough. Let's explain that. That's the, the at the bottom of the wall. Uh, it usually mm -hmm. would, and it's tapered up to, uh, upwards toward the wall. So, yes. Yeah. So there's yeah, no so corners for to get stuck in, basically. Right. So yeah. it's a four foot. We offer a four foot or a six foot liner. So from the, from the ground it would taper back towards the wall of the building. So it, it actually keeps the horse away from the columns of the building just enough to provide clearance for your feet and knees. So when you're riding a horse around in that arena, they, you know, because horses want to gra gravitate towards the fence or towards the exterior of the building uh, just for comfort's sake. So that tapered liner helps hold that horse off of the side walls of the arena enough that your knees and your toes sticking out, uh, you know, because we're all going to ride around with our heels down just right. Uh, you know, we don't want our feet to get banged against those columns as we go around. All right. Very good. And how many arenas do you put in that have the viewing lounges? Uh, more and more every day. So we've built several this year that have had a viewing lounge, um, especially if your facility intends on doing clinics, you know, hosting clinicians. The viewing lounge is really nice or if it's a, a lesson facility. You know, you, you have the, the, the children and the instructor in the arena doing a lesson. It's really nice for mom and dad or grandma and grandpa to be able to sit in the viewing lounge, watch what's going on, and be you know, protected from the elements and protected from the dust. So we, we do several buildings a year uh, that have a viewing lounge. And, of course, I'm a horse husband, so I worry about where to put the stuff. Uh, you also have to really keep in mind uh, where to store equipment. Are you going to be putting equipment in there? Uh, hay, bedding, all of that stuff. Horse trailer? Yeah, so we we built quite a few arenas that will have a storage component across one end. Um, I mean, you have to take into consideration where your drag tractor is going to sit, uh, your Cavaletti poles your uh, markers for your dressage arena, jumps, jump poles, uh, any, any sort of you know, supplemental aids or tools that you're going to have in that arena, you want to have somewhere convenient uh, to, to access those. So a nice storage area off one end of the building is really nice. Um, 
mirrors, you know, a lot of, a lot of disciplines like to have mirrors on one wall or another. Uh, you mentioned a viewing lounge that you can do additional uh, storage for hay and bedding or the horse trailer, that type of thing. All right. Very good. Well, thanks, Dennis, for doing this series. We really appreciate it. From stables and stall barns to riding arenas, a Morton building is professionally built for your functional needs, your horse's safety, and your budget. Save now through February on new buildings during their building value days. To learn more, visit mortonbuildings.com slash project slash equestrian, and I'll put that link in the show notes. You can go to the website. You'll find the equestrian stuff. You'll be good at that. And if you want to hear the past two segments that we did, but you missed them, go to horseradionetwork.com slash bar. Well, it is that time of the show where we bring back New Vocations Racehorse Adoption Program. And today we have Leandra Cooper. Welcome back, Leandra. Well, hello. Thank you for having me. It is always a pleasure. I mean, you're really part of the original crew here. So for those who are new, Leandra leads the thoroughbred side of New Vocations and We're very appreciative. She's always offering her wisdom and consistently tempting us with new horses every time she comes on, which (laughs) this is just a battle of her own wheels. Both Chris and I are now dating horse people, so it makes it a little bit easier and also much more enabling. But before we get into our adoptable horse of the week, um, I know New Vocations has set some new things and kind of rebranding some of your processes. And one of them is how to assess like the right horse for you with your levels. Can you go into detail about what changes people can expect? Absolutely. So as with any of our assessments, we are looking at the horse both from a physical and a mental standpoint. So when people are trying to figure out who are good candidates as potential adoptable horses for them, what we had before which to me, I still feel like that was relatively new. It was almost, it felt like it was kind of in a draft phase of things that then really stuck and people enjoyed having what were our levels. So we had different categories. We still have those categories, but instead of having a scale of one to five, we changed the scale to be one to three. And Those are now broader categories. So while it felt more limited before when we had a one to five scale where you were trying to fit a horse in a smaller box. So by expanding the size of those boxes, those levels, we're able to capture more horses in these generalized categories because as we know, Young horses, there's a lot of wiggle room when you're assessing them. You make good guesses and we try to evaluate them the very best we can. But really, there's a lot of variability. And so it didn't seem fair to put them in this box when we know that young horses are quite dynamic and are changing and are adaptable. And a lot of what happens in their development really needs to happen after they leave our facilities. So by changing our levels to one to three and really looking at the way that we're describing them, we wanted to avoid scenarios where people were just looking for the unicorn, you know, because that's not fair to a young horse and it's not fair to people's expectations when they're thinking, hey, I'm getting a, a, a horse who's already a unicorn because they're all works in progress. It's not really fair to, to categorize horses in a way that made it feel like we were kind of saying this is a good horse and this is a bad horse. And that's just really not how it is. So we want to make sure more than anything that these horses are matched appropriately with adopters who can appreciate all the horse's quirks and nuances and all the things that they bring to the table because what might not work for one person could work for another and vice versa. So the same goes for our physical levels. The categories both assess the the different, what you can expect just leading a horse around or the way that they are under saddle or how we're trying to describe their level of care required to maintain them. But a lot of people really looked at that physical level as well, which again, when even when we're talking about previous injuries, we know for lack of having this crystal ball, 
there is still a large variability in a horse who's had a knee chip or a horse who's had a condylar fracture and what they will and won't perhaps be able to do. And a lot of that can happen from fitness and conditioning and things that take years of development. So it's it's just hard to fit a horse in a smaller box. So by having broader categories, what we really want to focus on is having the conversations that matter. So avoid trying to avoid having horses be pinholed, but rather go back to the guidelines, these these more generalized guidelines, these broader categories that allow people to look at horses who will be most likely to be appropriate for them based off of their own goals, and then have conversations with their trainers, have conversations with us, the trainers of the horses, and be able to really have this more comprehensive assessment of, is this horse going to be appropriate for me where I am today and where I would like to be and what my goals are? Will I be able to appreciate everything that this horse brings to the table and be able to flourish together as an appropriate team. So people looking at the horses on our website can expect to have a different scale. And that scale doesn't mean that the horses are any lesser. It actually hopefully will make people broaden their horizons in looking at the horses who could very likely be great candidates for them. I'm looking at the scale. Um, We'll be sure to put this in our show notes, but it is so simplified. Like I'm looking at this and I'm like, oh, I would feel super confident having like a level one or level two horse for my next horse. Just reading the descriptions that you put for each aspect from leading and ground manners, grooming and tacking, riding, general demeanor. I also like that you separated the anticipated capability levels too. So Mm -hmm. When you're going through the horse adoption profiles, you can see where everyone's kind of sat and like make the best guess if you think that horse could fit for you, but not having to overthink it and over question. So I'm really excited about this. Yeah, so are we. And I think that it will be good for everybody in having an appropriate expectation of a young green horse that is transitioning to a new career path and really being able to look for horses who will be appropriate for them without um, looking for only these, you know, quote unquote, perfect unicorn horses and understanding Mm -hmm. that any of these horses could be the unicorn for the right person, hopefully. Yeah, seriously. Yeah, so, I mean, we've like we've been fans at RRP of your leveling system for ever since it came out. Like, we always hold that up as like the gold standard of how we wish you know everybody oh. was, was doing their system. You know, because it just makes it so much easier for people to understand at a glance. You know, and then obviously you yeah. sort of filter the horses you know that are level wise going to suit you, and then from there, you know, like you're saying, then from there find the best match. But that's been kind of an ongoing theme in our aftercare industry month discussions this month in February that like the this quest for the perfect unicorn that seems yeah. to be dominating horse shopping these days and it is it's just not super realistic so i like your I approach feel like it's you like know, looking that, for the perfect boyfriend like they're yeah, not the real <laughs> it, they yeah, all first have of all, a flaw it, it doesn't happen and second of all like you know i get it like horses are expensive and people like really want to be sure it's going to be a good match when they invest but i think mm-hmm. they also need to be realistic about what a good match is so i think anything you can do to sort of like demystify this whole process i think is yeah. super so you know what I also really want to do? I want Leander to come and ride my horses and tell me what level they are. So I know if I'm actually <laughs> oh my insane gosh, let's or if for this. <laughs> yeah. Cause I'm like, Oh, like is Jabber a three or am I just a moron? Like I can't decide. Right. Like I go back. Guys, let forth. us know if you want the social content. <laughs> yeah, we just let's have to do this. I would I love, love to know. Cause you actually did ride, ride my horse at one point when she was at new vocation. So I'd love to know like, what yeah, you surely you remember, today. right? Leander, you've only ridden like 400 horses since then. No, absolutely. Totally. <laughs> totally. Totally. Oh man. Yeah. Let's do it. We'll just bring our yeah, horses let's do to it. Kentucky. And you know what? We should do a whole ranking after they've been adopted for X mm-hmm. amount of time. Like we should have them come back and we'll get give them a you know, somebody referred to the levels as like the horse's scorecard. So yeah. we'll give them a new scorecard at year one or two. And you can bring your horse back and we will rank them 
no matter how long they've been away, we could do a whole event. Yeah. I think well, that'd like be fun. This, like they're so become like a certified too. new vocation score. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. It's a new ranking of judge. Like it's just like the horse show judge ranking, but it's, this is a specific type that you have to. And let's be clear, everyone. This is not to discriminate against horse. Like if they were, you know, a more high strung, maybe spirited, opinionated mare that we all love. Um, I'm not describing my horse, but I am. <laughs> um, it's okay if they're still that. Like, that's the thing. I think if anything, if you're bringing that horse along and you've seen the journey and like you would still score them as that, that just shows like your capabilities of a rider and trainer. Heck I yeah. think that's a huge compliment. We are very much against the concept of talking about a horse as good or bad. And it's, first of all, that's not a static judgment. That's it's always a dynamic. Mm-hmm. I mean, con- concept in general, like what again, like what is good for somebody might be bad for somebody else. But also, I think even if you have a horse who has more spirit or could be more difficult or has challenges, that 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 could make them the type of horse who, for example, could be really flashy in the show ring because they are a little bit more cocky. And yeah, they're going to ask questions when you tell them to do something when you're still training and, and you're developing your partnership and everything. But if you are able to harness that, that you're going to get a horse who is very offended by hitting poles. So they're not going to touch them. But mm-hmm. it also means that they're really not an easy ride. Or you have a horse who really doesn't like standing for the farriers, but they are exceptional around kids or, you know, Mm -hmm. horses come all across the board. And so one of the things that I kept going back to is, you know, if we're really saying that, and this goes for anybody, if you're saying that a horse is um, a unicorn, then, I mean, yes, we have horses who have exceptional ability. And that's where we want to be able to describe, hey, this is what is normal. This is what you should expect. And that's where we tried to kind of be in the middle of the rung. Like two is normal. So if you have a horse who's like, totally blew me away, stood like a statue in the cross size. One, that's exceptional. Like you shouldn't expect it all the time. So wonderful qualities. But really, if anybody is using a system where they are not using the full scale, it's not an appropriate scale or they're lying to you. We don't, mm-hmm. and we don't ever want to be in that, right? Like I, I, I never want, I'm never going to adopt a horse out who I think, who I truly think is dangerous. So I was like, that doesn't really belong in the scale because, but, but then we want to use a scale that really is appropriate, that uses the whole spectrum because that's how horses are. And that's what you should expect. And there is no bad to it. It's just an understanding of an estimate of a horse's, a, you know, current status, but just in the usefulness that it helps find them the right person. There is no, this horse is a level three for, you know, a personality quality. And so they're bad. They're not bad because there's always another side to the coin. Yeah. And actually my horse would probably be rated as very difficult and unattractive to a lot of people <laughs> when I had first adopted him, but he is just perfect for me, you know? So I, well, I so much of this is fluid to, too, right? Like, yes, you know, you exactly. might start with a level three horse and two years down the road. Now he's a level, like Jobber was a, you know, probably a 2.5 maybe in yeah. horse care when I got him and now he's a very yeah. easy one you know exactly. like, like it's gonna change I don't want a horse that's all ones because I'm gonna screw it up and I'm gonna make it <laughs> something else you know <laughs> that's right like you I don't want the unicorn I'm like that's too much pressure yeah. that's so funny I hadn't thought about it like that then you only have you know up to go from there right and of course know. that's implying that you know the higher numbers are bad and that's not the case either but like you know again like you the the person that ends up with the horse can really change that too. Well, so I think I like think, mine, yeah. it's definitely a lover to pieces and she is much more patient than she used to be. Like she actually stands and falls asleep in the cross ties where it used to be lots of pawing and demanding attention. Exactly. But um, yeah. 
So there's and, areas and, she's grown and other areas. Like, I love that she is quote unquote spicy to some, but like, I think it's fun personality. I know exactly what exactly. she's feeling. And I feel like I can read her better than other horses. Yeah. And so much of just the way that we are making sure that somebody understands how the horse is right now is exactly what you're saying. Because if there, if somebody was going to be scared away by a horse who was uncomfortable brushing or pawing, you know, if, Mm -hmm. or if they would kick out or, um, if those things scared the adopters, then their horse probably wouldn't be a good match for them. So we want to make sure that we're categorizing them in a way that's just going to find them the right adopter, because that isn't like exactly as you're saying, this will change inevitably. It's going to change. These horses are in the early years of their life. Mm -hmm. And what we're looking at right now is, are you the type of person who's going to be freaked out by this happening or not? So when we find somebody who's just like level one across the board, I don't want anything that could put a foot wrong that we're just like, that's a scary threshold for us as a trainer, because it means that person expects perfection of very young, very green horses who will look and act probably a lot different in a year. So, mm-hmm. you know, if you're like, you know, I'd like a horse who who you think who will get to that level one because I'd like to have a young rider on it in three years, we can help you find that horse, but it might, we're, we're not typically expecting them to be that l- perfect standard it's right Child now. safe, which like, if, you, if you're looking for the child safe thoroughbred, we yeah. recommend you listen to our resellers panel. That was the last please, episode. Please do. Yeah. <laughs> um, please I don't do. think we've ever suggested like horses coming from new vocations are ready to go to their first like pony club or 4-H show or go for a camping trip with the husband riding on like they're, they're young and they're not yet, everything. No. And yeah, it's a new experience, but some of them are going to handle the transition easier than others. And some are like, they're athletes. Like they want to stay athletes. So they need someone who's going to give them that job to do what they love to do. And it doesn't make them a difficult horse. They just need someone who's matching that energy. So I love this. I think it's a brilliant concept and you've just made it even easier for people like Kristen and I to navigate as well as our listeners. Um, and speaking of, let's like put it to the test. Let's bring our adoptable horse in. We are talking about election integrity. Tell us a little bit about him. I love election integrity. So he, I, we just nickname him Prez because, of course, election integrity. You could go so many different directions with a bar name, mm-hmm. but Prez is a giant, and he is an absolute sweetheart. He is a horse who has gone through rehab with us for a knee surgery to remove a chip and he's got some arthritic change there. So he is a little bit more limited. So probably not going to be a big time jumping career type guy for him. We really are looking mostly for a flat career, but I'll tell you, you know, he's a horse who based off of the surgery and some of the changes, we were, you know, we kind of knew that he wasn't going to be like a Grand Prix jumper, but this is a horse who doesn't know that he has any limitation. So I could see him taking over a dressage ring and having just an absolute blast. But he's also big enough where, mean man, if you want to step over some logs or some little cross rails, it's not going to break him for sure because he'll do it in an easy step. But the thing that I really love about Prez the most is his brain because this horse, the video that I have up on his profile is of the first ride in our program. He had had months and months of rehab. He had been kept in overnight because of some bad weather. And he learned so quickly and continues to just wow us with his aptitude for learning and his willingness to please even when he's not really sure what you're asking him to do so even things like getting him to understand the concept of leg yields he was just trying to figure it out and then once he got it you didn't really have to reteach him again like he absorbed it and applied it and it that's just such a phenomenal quality that again is not something that I would expect of a young horse that's not my expectation but when it happens it's 
just so pleasant to work with them and to be able to build and it makes things move along quite well. So for somebody who's looking for a horse for say the makeover, a mind like that is absolutely priceless because you have a more limited time frame to prepare them for a challenging competition. So a horse like Prez is really going to be able to just eat up that type of competition. But even if you didn't want to and you just wanted to develop him over the years or you wanted him to just be a pleasure mount, I mean, this horse is willing to please. But he can be a little bit strong. He's a big guy. He's not a horse that I would, again, like throw an absolute junior or like a child Mm -hmm. or um, somebody who would be intimidated by that because he can have a nice big step if you want him to. He's learning to rebalance. So he leans a little bit more on his forehand, but he is so willing to learn and he's just really nice around the barn and in all the other aspects of like when he goes outside and when you just want to love on him and a total sweet, gentle giant. So, I mean, he's he's a really cool horse that everybody listening should go look at because I think he's going to be a super, super phenomenal partner for someone. I love what you mentioned about the makeover too, because I think a lot of people are like, oh, the makeover, you know, it's for every horse and not every horse is going to be a great match for that. And I mm-hmm. think like the savviest trainers are going to seek out horses like this that are quick learners and like to learn and want mm-hmm. to please. Like that's that's how people should be approaching it, you know, not necessarily putting every single horse through that process because it just doesn't work for everybody. That's so, right. And I, yeah. I like to remind adopters who are considering that too, that it's the competition is what it is. There's no point in, you know, getting a horse who needs a much longer time frame and then, you know, being upset that it doesn't fit into the makeover. Like the makeover has the schedule it has. And so if you want to be successful for the competition, you need to get a horse for the competition and mm-hmm. not expect it to fit the mold the other way around. Right. Um, because some horses, in order to reach their optimal results, they're going to need a longer time. And that's the same with people. People don't all fit in the same shapes and sizes and mentalities. So you know, a horse like this is going to be one who I could see thriving in that sort of atmosphere and just being able to rise to that challenge because that, you know, it really is fun. I mean, I just love watching him in his videos and you can tell he's eager to please. He's listening intently. I mean, it helps you're a phenomenal writer too, Leander, but like, oh, he's just, he's just soft in everything he does. He's not looking like he's questioning or guessing. He's just like, I'm just going to go with the flow. Like oh, yes, someone canter. will tell me if I'm wrong. I've just gotten to the canter. That, oh, he yeah. just floats. Oh, man. Yeah. And Let me tell you, I like 17 hands. Like, he no, doesn't look it, <laughs> no. And he, and he's still growing, of course, but I, I really point. don't sit the canner a lot of times because of course young horses they have awkward proportions they're figuring mm-hmm. out their bodies i have a long torso so it's a lot of concussion <laughs> and a lot of torque up there and i was like oh, let me see if i'll just like sit my little perch here and i was like this is quite pleasant so i'll say if you see me sitting the canner on a horse that should say a lot about them <laughs> He looks like he would transition very well into a dressage ring. Like, yeah, very lovely dressage. Also, just lovely hunter prospect, too. He's going to fill out so nicely as he gets older and gets more muscle, stops growing. He's a little butt high right now, but he's, yes, he is. Yeah. His photos, he's just chill and content. And you can tell he's taking everything in, but not in a way of overwhelmment. He's just like, yeah, I'm just here for the party. Everybody wants a big horse. Like, there he is. True. Go get him. I know we can't show Zach this post at all. (laughs) One of my favorite things, like especially for the hunter type horses is like, if you see a horse is really enjoying his job and just totally relaxed and like, I got this. I always, it's like the floppy ear moment where it's Mm -hmm. like their ears are just kind of flopping along at the canner is where you're just like, oh, this horse is having himself a day, like a a good day. And (laughs) I feel like he could be a floppy ear horse. 
Mm-hmm. I love those. That's how Shorty Harmon lives his life. I'm just flying yeah. around. <laughs> I love that you use his real name. That's so Yeah, funny. that's his full name, Shorty Harmon. <laughs> well, Leandra, thank you so much for showing us um, election integrity. And he is for the amazing, amazing offer price of $1,500. Like, come on. You're gonna you're getting a horse who's like so eager to work for fifteen hundred dollars. Yes, it's, it's like they're free. So yeah. everyone, go ahead to newvocations.org or horseadoption.com. Both of them work, and put in your application because you do have to be approved before you can bring any one of these horses home. And if you miss out on election integrity, don't worry; they have plenty of others who will probably be a good fit. And now you have the new level system to find out who they are. Leandra, thanks again for joining us. Oh, absolutely. It's my pleasure. You can find our show notes and links to today's guests on the website at horseradionetwork.com. Like us on Facebook and Instagram. Just search for Retired Racehorse Radio. Follow us on Twitter at Horse Radio. You can find me on Instagram at The Horseback Rider, and you can find me on Facebook at Jobber Bill, Racehorse to Ranch Horse. My email is kbentley at the rrp.org. You can find me on Instagram at MissFitMare, and my email is joy at horseradionetwork.com. Thank you so much to our sponsors, Kentucky Performance Products, Cashel Company, and Morton Buildings, and to our partners, New Vocations Racehorse Adoption Program and the Retired Racehorse Project. And don't forget to check out all the other shows on the Horse Radio Network, part of Equine Network at horseradionetwork.com. Remember to set your goals high and love to learn from every ride. And always add more leg. Bye, guys. Bye.